So let's go on. So the next speaker for today is uh, Professor Volker Marhaufer from uh, it was a professor in environmental science. Actually, the specialization is social science, and that's actually the focus of my work. So our that's the name of my talk, Sustainable Decision Making for the Anthropocene. And I'm at a campus Östersund at the Department of Ecotechnology and Sustainable Building Engineering. My background is manifold, so I'm a lawyer, I'm a natural scientist, and I'm an ecological economist. I was before at the University of Vienna and at uh, United Nations Universities Institute of Advanced Studies in Japan. And sorry, I'm giving this talk neither in my mother tongue nor in Swedish. So please, apologies if there are some mistakes in there. Our, I will first speak about challenges of the Anthropocene, then sustainable development and decisions, sustainable development for decision making, later on point four, particular operationalizing tools, and then analyzing organizations instruments together with these tools, and later I have a summary and the outlook, and this all in 15 minutes, hopefully. So uh, the great acceleration that's from the Anthropocene uh, Journal, it shows that just in the last more or less 50 years, humans became one of the major or the major force on the globe in terms of growth in almost everything, population, resources, energy use, so the social and the uh, environmental system is massively influenced by humans. We have here a graph, which is quite hard to read, but I will just briefly explain, and this doesn't work very well. We have here something called the ecological footprint per person in global hectare, which starts from zero and goes up to something like a world biocapacity, which would be available for each human. And we see here many countries which are far be above this biocapacity in their per capita use. And we have many countries which are far below. And we have here something called the Human Development Index from the uh, United Nations, uh, which indicates on which stage uh, a certain uh, country is in terms of education and so on. And you see here that some many countries are on the left side and many countries are on the right side. And so our, here is something called the Global Sustainability Development Quadrant, which is 2012 here, 2060, uh, 1961, it was still here also, but we reduced the biocapacity of the world. And now the question is how we really can change our societies, our, our behavior, our energy use, our resource use, perhaps in this direction, staying on the same human development level, or giving perhaps some countries even the possibility to increase their level yeah, of consumption. So that's the big challenge. Our, we have here our uh, graph from uh, Stefan, Rockstar and all. So that's from uh, 2015, the updated version. It's called uh, the planetary boundaries. And they calculated where are the boundaries for humans. So green means we are still within our planetary boundaries in our resources and energy use with regard to these, I think, nine factors. And red means we are far beyond uh, what is sustainable for the world. So in nitrogen, phosphor, we are in the red zone already. And genetic biodiversity, so we lost many plant and animal species, for example. So there we have already crossed those uh, scientific boundaries are, and that's from the, actually from the Stockholm uh, Environmental Institute. So that, that's more the environmental, specific environmental carrying capacities to stay within. We need, therefore, I forgot to mention it, we need, therefore, some, somehow something like uh, international fine tuning also. So, for example, here we have a share of population in percent in gray and the number of so-called new consumers in millions in black and new consumer is a consumer which uh, uses about or which has an annual income of about uh, 7,000 US dollars and you can compare it for example in the US you have a population of uh, 
about 300 something million and about 80 percent that's data from uh, 2000 actually about 80 percent of those people have already uh, 7,000 uh, US dollars or more available, and that's uh, in absolute numbers about 240 million. But for example, in China, you have the same number in absolute uh, name in absolute numbers. So about 240 million have more than 7,000 uh, dollars available, but the share of the population is about 20 percent. Yeah. So just to show you this issue, which is also an issue of intra-national intra, uh, fine-tuning. Then our, we have since about the 80s, sustainable development recognized as goal. Uh, it's about human needs, it's human wants of the current and future generations. We have three main dimensions. There are social, the environmental and the economic sustainability dimension. And 2012, it was updated in a report of the UN, The Future You Want, which was signed by, I think, all countries of the world, uh, that we need a balanced integration of all those three dimensions and similar in uh, global goals, which were concluded 2015 at the UN level, again from all countries of the world, the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. It was again mentioned we need this balanced dimension, balanced integration of the, all the dimensions of sustainable development. But uh, it's always the issue how, yeah? how to balance those dimensions, how to balance and integrate those issues. And there are quite many concepts trying to describe this balance with one uh, picture. And I worked on this and looked at what are the shortcomings of those pictures. And there are one, two, three, four main shortcomings. And I will present later a concept called free sustainability, which addresses these shortcomings. Here, just some examples for these shortcomings. The misinterpretation of embeddings, Al Kington, quite a famous book, which embeds the, uh, which says the society is embedded at economy, but there are many societal functions which are should not embedded in economy, like love, like relationships, friendships, that has nothing to do with economy, but each economic system works with people. No economic system works without people, yeah? So it should be the other, other way around. Misjudgments of equity, lacking of limitations, the triangle doesn't say anything about uh, limitations of the system and lack of adequate decision support. These graphs are nice, but they don't tell you how you should decide in the balancing and integrating of the three dimensions. And that's also about the sustainable development goals a little bit. So 3D sustainability. Uh, it uh, is uh, linked with the natural capital, where the social capital, we all are in integrated. So if you look at your table, you have water there. If you look at your clothes, where does it come from? It comes from cotton. So we are totally dependent. If I close my nose, I will close my mouth. How long could I stay until I drop down? Yeah, so two minutes perhaps, I'm diver. I'm not sure if everybody could stay two minutes without air. So we are totally dependent on the natural uh, capital. Yeah? We often forget it. And therein embedded is what humans make as our man-made capital, economic capital. We use the environment. We, uh, we have the environmental capacity, which we use in a certain way. The social capacity, we train people, we educate people also at the university, capacity building. And we use, uh, we develop economic capital also in certain ways. I will speak about this triangle later. It connects the capacities and we have something about caring capacities and we don't want to go beyond those caring capacities. We don't want to exceed, for example, the climate caring capacities, the capacity of our, our atmosphere to absorb CO2, for example. We have here regional caring capacities. We have the water framework directive in the EU with the water basins. These are something like caring capacities for flooding. These are regional uh, limitations. Or we have one nation, for example, here, Curaçao, which also has uh, uh, one uh, carrying capacity regarding, for example, the occurrence of one deer. And just one example where environmental carrying capacities and also social carrying capacities come together. We are here in Norway. We have this animal here in Norway. And this animal has a certain carrying capacity when it comes to visitors. Yeah? 
We have one visitor group which stays far away, the other one stays close away, comes closer, and here's the animal. So what will the an happen with this animal? Its current capacity is perhaps very low, and it will perhaps disappear. But also this visitor group is not very amused about the other visitor group, so the other visitor group also exceeded this current capacity, the social current capacity of this visitor group. So from this concept, we come to a look from above to this and to this, and I will make it more precise here. So when you look on the triangle from above, you can see are the, uh, the, capaci the current capacities here, the social current capacity, and you have, the, and you have also the environmental capacity, the economic capacity and the social capacity, and they're interlinked. They're interlinked with criteria, which I took from this triangle, and I then developed from this criteria decision-making. These are just our, the definitions for those criteria. Sufficiency, it's the voluntary decision of an individual, for example. I don't consume meat anymore. By this decision, you reduce your energy consumed by the factor eight because the production of, of meat takes eight times more energy than the production of uh, vegetables, for example. Yeah? And so this is a voluntary decision not to consume. I don't fly, I don't have a car, or I have a, a, slow, uh, a smaller car. That's a voluntary decision. And even this can support it, be supported by public decisions, by public laws, by public subsidies. These are then absolute reductions also, but they are not voluntary, so that's perhaps in the public interest. A law prescribes that a certain car street has not to be built, for example. And these are eco-efficiency, social efficiency. It's relative improvements. I can reduce the number of a, uh, the, the size of a car, the energy use of a car, but this reduction doesn't mean much if the number and numbers of cars go up and up, yeah? So we reduce one unit, but at the same time we have a growth, thank you, we have a growth of the number of units. And this number of units outnumbers our environmental gains or our social gains also. And so this is the so-called rebound effect, which happens everywhere almost in the society. We try to get better, efficient, more efficient, yeah? Also in our communication, but then the emails increase, yeah? number of emails increase, and how many emails can you still carry in your social, individual, human caring capacity? So, when you look from the top and from this embedding which I showed before, you can make a certain a hierarchy of this criteria, and this hierarchy then looks like this, but it's not fixed, it's a flexible trade-off mechanism, and you can change it through the burden of proof. You cannot prescribe, for example, to a country like Burkina Faso, you have to grow your consumption because they're already far below the ecological footprint. Yeah? So they can go with other measures, other criteria forward. These are just some examples which I developed in another paper are from United Nations, uh, from WTO on the global level, and on the regional level, national level, other examples where this burden of proof works as are apply, uh, when applying these criteria, just to show that it also works in practice. And that's the application on norms. You can also apply this on organizations. Here we have two ministries. This is a ministry of, cap of, of capacity. It develops the capacity. It uses agriculture, forestry, water economy. It uses the capacity of nature. And the Ministry of Environment would be a capital ministry. What happened after 2002 in this country? The capital minister and the capacity minister was put together. And that causes conflicts of interest. And it's often very intransparent then how decisions are taken in this ministry. Yeah? So it would be, the recommendation would be rather from the scientific point to keep these uh, capacity and capital ministers are apart. Yeah? Then, just uh, how to use uh, organizations and instruments for sustainable Anthropocene governments, how to use the tools at uh, the global, at the governmental level. We have here 
instruments, information focused instruments, instruments which are economic incentive focused or rule focused instruments. And actually only the government has all three types of instruments. These rule focused instruments are only with our a nation uh, because they have this power to uh, release rules and to enforce them. Non-profit uh, profit stakeholders, companies, for example, they can work with advertisement, they can work with economic incentives, and non-profit stakeholders, NGOs, have mainly this kind of uh, information-focused instruments. But of course, there are some other rules. The Kamprad Foundation has more money than some African country, yeah? So there are, there are some, there's some uh, individuality in this whole, uh, yeah, and all those Organizations are of course formed by individuals with own ideas, with own norms. We come back to this criteria which I introduced, sufficiency, effectiveness and so on. And we have these three types of rules. And then you can look at public campaigning, which be, could be for example used for promoting sufficiency. Yeah? Go more by foot, go more by bicycle. Yeah? And that could be done by all three types of stakeholders which I introduced previously. But sufficiency could be also introduced with economic subsidies or with so-called enabling laws. Yeah? Public transport law, which enables people to go by bicycle. Yeah? Many, in many countries, you cannot go by bicycle because it's just too, too dangerous. Yeah? But if you prescribe by law, you have to have the bicycle lane, then it's an enabling law to enable people to go by bicycle, not by car. Yes. So. And yeah, these are other examples on the slide. So, and uh, of course, there are partnerships and there are policy and instrument mixes. This is just a summary of what I said till now. How to balance the three dimensions, 3D sustainability as our some uh, concept which offers criteria, particular operating to tools, and we have three types of instruments as main instruments but of course, all depending on the context also. Just an outlook, 3D sustainability and the SDGs. This is something which was recently developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center. And 3D sustainability was developed actually in 2008. And if you look at it, it looks rather similar. Yeah? It's quite nice overlapping. And then the question is, how are 3D sustainability and this interpretations could influence also the interpretation of the our, of this our sustainable development goals and their integration and balancing. Okay, that was quite much perhaps in 15 minutes. I hope it wasn't too much. I hope you enjoyed this show and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions, remarks? You talked very much about limits, talk about boundaries, and you talked about caring capacity, and uh, uh, and different fixed limits. What I'm, I'm asking you now is how everything is flexible in a way. What happens is flexible, and we have a rather chaotic or, or non-linear uh, environment out there, and. When you talk about um, legal instruments, I missed slightly uh, how you um, how you act, how you should act when it comes to changing the incentives or the the, the uh, different instruments in order in order to be in connection with these fluctuations mm. and and uh, how that really does. Uh, go into the private property area because that is, is something that's very crucial in, in law. But it is very uh, felt deep down in very many people that this is mine, I should do with, with, with it what I want. But adaptation might mean something quite different and something quite new uh, in this new Anthropocene. Thank you. 
So there are many issues in your question, a very deep question, thank you. Uh, the one thing is uncertainty, and I had it on the slide, uh, on one of the slides actually, that uncertainty is of course uh, very, uh, an issue where things are very complex and often you don't know what you don't know. Often you don't know that you don't know something, yeah? So our uncertainty is inherent in many scientific questions and many practical questions. And our the precautionary principle is a principle which is developed in international environmental law, which tries to address this uncertainty. Yeah? And it comes from game theory. Also, you should address a complex system in, the way, in a way that those who are skeptical and who want to prevent against the worst case have the, la the least problems with the solution. Yeah? So you try to uh, address a solution, a situation, a complex situation in a way that you cause the least harm with your decision. And that's, as you know, our issue in international environmental law quite broadly with addressing these complex, uncertain decisions. The second issue is uh, how you enter private property and also all kinds of human rights, so-called human rights. Yeah? So private property is also a sort of human right, but it's not limitless. You have also often this restriction subject to public law, yeah? because public law is addressing the public interest and it can influence the private property. In construction law, for example, you have certain ways how you are allowed to construct your building. Yeah? You have to ask for public, uh, for public permission how you uh, construct a certain building. So there is, this is also actually practical a way of influencing our uh, private property and with sufficiency as the overall uh, subject. Yeah? You try to make people voluntarily give up something. Yeah? But to feel better, yeah? if I become vegetarian or when I became vegetarian, I felt better. Yeah? I felt better, I felt healthier, I became healthier. It was fine. Yeah? So that's why sufficiency, the voluntary behavior, is here also as a first criteria to, addre to address yeah, with public policies. So I hope I have answered your question a little bit. Yeah? But thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you. Actually, we have no more time. Uh, and here is a gift from Israel University. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you once more. Yeah.